Hey, what's going on guys? My name is Proja and today we're going to be taking a look on $1,000 gaming and editing PC. This PC will play all games at 1080p and even 1440p at reasonably good frame rates and plus with the components you can easily live stream, edit and obviously play games. Sorry if my voice does sound a bit shit, I've been a cold all week and still want to get this video out. And this PC is epic and definitely worth looking at. Now last week I put out a $500 gaming PC. The only problem with that is that after a few days the price raised by 60, then 100, and now even more. Some of that was probably just down to rebates or bad luck. But for this week I'm not going to be including rebates, so if you want to get this build in say a month or so, the price change should be marginal. Anyway, put a comment down below what price range or location you want to cover. And without hesitation, let's get into it. So for the CPU, you've got the Intel Core i7-4790K 4.0GHz Quadricom processor. The processor costs $320 and is going to be the heart of our build for rendering, streaming, etc. If you live near a micro center, you can even pick this up for as cheap as $250, but for convenience sake, we're just going to leave out at $320. This is a 4 core with hyper threading, so it's a total of 8 threads, and with more games starting to utilize this, it should become more noticeable. And as the name suggests, it does run at 4.0GHz with a 4.4GHz boost clock. Commonly people can get us to run around 4.6GHz when overclocked, which is definitely good and for the performance boost you'll get in games and other activities. Now the CPU may be overkill for gaming, but it gives you plenty of freedom to run multiple applications such as Skype, Chrome and Word while gaming. If you want to use this just for gaming, then look into getting the i5-4690K, but for editing, streaming or 3D modelling, this will definitely help. Not to mention that, I personally reckon this is the best CPU you can really get on the Haswell lineup. That doesn't include Haswell E by the way. Now for overclocking, you could go with a more expensive cooler, but like the H100i, but I just want to squeeze out as much performance as possible. And so we've got the Cooler Master, High 12 Evo, CPU cooler, and that should be good. The cooler costs $30 and is certainly worth it when it comes to overclocking and keeping the temps cool. The CPU does come with a stock cooler, but you guys should know by now that we don't use those since they just don't do well at overclocking, and even the temps can be still high when using them. The aftermarket cooler doesn't break the bank and should be good for us. Now onto the motherboard. For this we've got the MSI Z97 Gaming 5 motherboard at $125. This is an absolute sick motherboard and speaking from experience, MSI always create quality MOBOs and for the price this MOBO is absolutely loaded. It's on the LGA 1150 socket and on the overclocking enthusiast C97 chipset. It is an ATX size board so regular size and has 4 available RAM slots and supports up to 32 gigs of RAM and up to 3300 MHz. It has RAID support, crossfire support and SLI support so you can definitely consider running multiple GPU setups for the future. Not to mention it has 6 6 gigabyte per second SATA ports and M.2 port so there's plenty of storage potential here as well meaning that you can add a DVD drive later on or more storage in general to archive games, programs and the rest. Some nice things about this is that it comes with OCGD which automatically overclocks your CPU and RAM as well as killer ethernet which you can prioritise games applications on your PC for your network bandwidth. Basically meaning that your ping can be lower resulting in less potential lag. Personally I don't notice a difference but it's still great. Not to mention that BIOS is freaking awesome and really simple for overclocking. You should see a guy by me in a couple of months or so. Lastly is USB 3.0 headers, 2 USB gaming ports, 2 USB 2.0 and an additional 4 USB 3.0 ports. This motherboard is a great buy and for the price and the red and black theme it fits well. Now for RAM we've got the G-Scale Rip Draws X Series 8GB 2x4GB DDR3 18.66 x memory. This memory does cost $30 and to go over it simply it's great for the price. It's cheaper than Kingston and for some reason cheaper than the same 1600MHz model but it runs at 18.66MHz and 8GB is more than enough for gaming and even rendering. Not to mention that the heat spreaders have a really nice red and black theme, which fits nicely with the build. If you want, you can upgrade to 16GB in the future because of Movo, but again, that's an option in the future, you don't really need it right now. Now for storage, we've got two things. First, it's the Kingston SSD Now V300 Series 120GB 2.5 inch solid state drive. The SSD costs $45 and this is where you're going to be loading your OS and key applications onto. 120GB isn't a lot, so don't expect to load a ton of stuff onto it. We will have around 100 gigs left of data after the operating system has reloaded onto it. Wow. Now the benefit of having stuff stored on here is that it loads much faster. So having your operating system on here will boot much quicker. And because 120 gigs isn't enough, we've also thrown a Western Digital Caviar Blue 1TB 3.5-inch 7200 RP maternal hard drive, costing us $50. Now on here you're going to store all of your games, files and other applications onto. This is great for mass storage as well as with WD's track record, this is really reliable. I've actually got one of these in my system which is where I've loaded all my applications onto, but yeah, one terabyte should be enough for now. Again, you can add more storage in the future so don't get caught on capacity too much. Now for the GPU, we're just going to be doing most of the heavy lifting in games, it's going to be the MSI Radeon R9 390. I've covered this before on some of my other builds but the GPU costs $305 and is worth every penny. 
Of course, this is very costly, but if you're going to be looking at a $1,000 build, chances are you're not just going to be doing some light gaming. Anyway, it runs at 1060 MHz and can be mildly overclocked, but it has a massive 8 gigs of VRAM. 8 gigs is probably more than this thing can chew through, but since VRAM doesn't stack in multiple GPU configs, it can make things a lot more interesting when adding another one of these in Crossfire and then playing at high resolutions like 1440p or 4K. It obviously supports Crossfire and other AMD technologies such as FreeSync, Raptor for game recording, which is actually pretty decent, it's actually what I'm using right now because for some strange reason, Shadowplay just keeps crashing on Windows 10. And then it's also got virtual super resolution and a bunch more. It has two DVI-D ports, one HDMI and one DisplayPort connection. If you are getting this card for 1080p, I recommend you get a 144Hz monitor or a 1440p monitor, because for the most part this can push the 1440p mark or really high-end plus 60Hz gaming for 1080p. If not, it's not a problem since you can just downscale 1440p to 1080 won't look as nice but it'll still look better than 1080 itself. And this is an absolutely sweet card and for the MSI cooler it makes it even more badass. In regards to the case, we've got the Corsair Speco 2 ATX mid tower case costing us $55. Before I go into the features of this case, I just want to point out that for $15 more you can go into and get the Fantex N3 Pro M ATX mid tower case, which in my opinion looks nicer, has more storage potential, and is made by Fantex, which is a plus for quality. Now I didn't go for it because I wanted to be as close to the $1000 price range as possible, and so if you want to spend that extra $15, then go for that instead. Anyway, the Corsair Spectre is still really good, it has a nice red and black colour theme going on, and it is an ATX mid-tower case. Now it comes with two included 120mm fans, but you can add up to another four. It has two external 5 and a quarter inch bays for a DVD drive or fan controller, and has room for two internal 2.5 inch drives, like an SSD, or three internal 3.5 inch drive bays. It's front panel USB 3.0 and has a nice side panel window to view all of your components, and according to some of the reviews, it has really good cable management space, but the Hyper 212 only just about fits it but nevertheless, you shouldn't have any problems. Lastly for the parts, we have the PSU. For this, we've got the Corsair CX750W 80 Plus Bronze Certified semi Modular ATX Power Supply, costing us $60. For the most part, you shouldn't underspend it on the PSU, and between 650 watts to 750 watts is great, but by going with 750 watts, it gives you a lot more free room. Not really much to say about this, but to be honest, it's a decent power supply, and with that over, let's get onto the benchmarks. So for the benchmarks, I just quickly want to mention that this is an approximation of the results I found online. I'm only going to mention 1080p and 1440p since I don't think 4K is viable with this card until you run it in Crossfire. Do you know that this is for the when the card is overclocked and at stock? But for now, here are the numbers. So with The Witcher 3 at the Ultra preset with Hairwork Soft, we're getting around 54fps at 1080p and 14fps at 1440p. That's when this card's at stock. Overclocked, you should see 1080p go up to 57fps and 43fps at 1440p. Not a huge difference, but it's definitely not bad since this game is really demanding to run. In GTA 5, the R9 390 at stock settings, where in game settings are set on high at 2x MSDA, gets 92fps at 1080p and 63fps at 1440p. Overclock this card and you'll get a modest 98fps at 1080p and 67fps at 1440p, overclock at least. As for Crisis 3 in the very high preset, you should get around 60fps at 1080p and 37fps at 1440p when the card is at stock. Overclocking it and you'll see 65fps at 1080p and 41fps at 1440p. Now onto Far Cry 4, which is somewhat similar. Settings for this game is on Ultra, again at 2 times MSAA, and at stock you'll get around 77fps at 1080p and 51fps at 1440p. Overclock this card and you'll see performance rise to 81fps at 1080p and 55fps at 1440p. Next we've got Battlefield 4 the Ultra preset, and at stock you should see 110fps at 1080p and 76fps at 1440p. Overclock you can see these figures jump to 115 FPS at 1080p and 81 FPS at 1440p. It's definitely worth going to a high refresh rate monitor for these sort of games. Now in Fallout 4, on Ultra with FXAA turned on, you'll get around 74 FPS at stock at 1080p and at 1440p you can expect around 57 FPS. Lastly, we've got Black Ops 3 with everything set to Ultra or High and AA set to Filmic SMAA T2X, which is really taxing on the GPU and gives you around 105 FPS at 1080p of 66 FPS at 1440p. As you can see, if you're playing at 1080p, you should really invest in a 144Hz monitor or a 1440p monitor. Personally, I would still prefer the 144Hz, but if you guys have no idea which one you should go for, I've made a top 5 monitor list, which you guys should really check out if you haven't already. Anyway guys, hope you have enjoyed, and if you liked this video and found it helpful, give it a like, and if you didn't, you guys know what to do. If you have any suggestions for future videos, share them down below, and I'll get back to you. As always, thanks for watching everyone, stay awesome, and this is Proto. Later.